Welcome back, everyone. This week, we're going to be talking about Ponzi's and zombies. Are you even paying attention? The link to this article will be in the description below. Let's get into this. Ponzi's and zombies abound. The state-led growth story in the cannabis industry is a funny one. State growth is a proxy for revenue growth. Revenue growth is a proxy for EBITDA growth, and EBITDA growth is a proxy for cash flow. People are using a proxy for a proxy for a proxy that doesn't even translate well due to the usury interest rates and astronomical taxes levied against the companies. Just as strange is the fact that most people are okay with this. Many of these MSOs need constant state expansion to maintain the appearance of growth and success. These companies' growth strategies heavily rely on continuously opening new markets, states, because they fail to demonstrate sustainable profitability in existing markets. They need new markets to pay for their now unprofitable older markets. The reason being is that their profits have atrophy due to the inevitability of prices normalizing. These MSOs require abnormal prices to maintain profitability and those abnormal profits disappear after a year or two. Might you notice the parallels between these MSOs and a Ponzi scheme? The requirement of new investments to generate cash flow to pay off old investments due to not actually being self-sustaining. Now in reality, they're not a Ponzi scheme, but the state-led growth story is very Ponzi-esque. More accurately, many of these companies are zombie companies, meaning that they don't organically generate enough cash flow to sustain their business and thus need to externally raise more money. Many of these companies need state churn. It's crucial for their narrative. And when that isn't enough, they need to entertain the idea of potential government catalysts to keep the narrative intact. Each new next thing is the savior for the industry. In reality, it's just temporary means to prop up the narrative but not to improve or address the rot in the company's business practices. Pretty fictional stories meant to conceal the truth sounds familiar to what Mr. Ponzi did. It's a chronic churn of shifting the goalpost. Each new state will be what will help the industry. But let me ask you this. How many states have now legalized? And how much better off are those companies? To me, it would seem that each new state that comes online makes matters worse, not better. Of course, I'm speaking in generalities, but it does hold up true in large part. The crazy part is that this is within the confines of what amounts to a pseudo-oligopoly due to limited licenses and interstate commerce not being allowed. Each boom state becomes an eventual bust state. It's not just because of the state, but because of these companies' business strategy. It's one of simple game theory. As I outlined in this article, you can click on a link in the description below to get to this article, then then click on that link if you would like, but I digress. The below image is in regards to shipping companies, but it just as well applies to these companies. The Prisoner's Dilemma. This is not a flaw, but a feature. Their strategy was to expand as rapidly and if need be as unprofitably as possible. The unprofitable part is a, foreseeable, is a foreseeable product. Like I said, not a fluke or a flaw, but part of their overarching strategy. This is nothing new and these results should have been expected. Simply put, normalized prices are a death sentence. I've outlined some of these dynamics in the arc of development of new industry section of an article I've written here. And it reads, A flood of cheap capital pours into a new sector or industry. This leads to overinvestment, which leads to overexpansion, overproduction, and overcapacity. At the onset, demand outweighs supply. This leads to the first movers making profit. The analysts normalize those profits for future projections, but the profits will soon disappear. Because as often as the case, the market is heavily fragmented. In the case of this industry, this leads to each player saying something along the lines of, look how much money we're making on 10,000 square feet grow facilities. Just imagine if we expand to 100,000 square feet. The lead time to build gives a false impression at sustainable profits, but inevitably a deluge of supply comes online. Such projects are expensive, 
So they're interested in the undercutting competition to recoup their capital. This flood of supply overwhelms demand, profits get competed away, margins compress from positive territory to negative territory, they take on debt to stay afloat, and inevitably bankruptcy and consolidation occurs in the industry. End quote. Like I said, this shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. The concerning part is that the vast majority of people still don't know what happened over the last decade, as I just alluded to in that quote. At best, they have a low resolution and ill-defined conceptual idea along the lines of, they've been working out the kinks and not everything has gone as planned and that this is a new industry and it's the government's fault. Which is to say that they really don't understand much at all. The game has changed. People aren't paying attention. The game has changed. The hype isn't what it used to be and the rate of change of growth has deteriorated and revenues are stalling. In an intellectually dishonest fashion, I'd expect many analysts and podcasters and social media influencers to start moving the goalpost from EBITDA to gross margin to revenue and more recently debt pay down. They might go from talking about EBITDA margins to then just talking about EBITDA in nominal dollar terms because, well, the EBITDA margins are collapsing, but they are making more money due to state expansion. But they just will ignore the collapsing margins. So on and so on. It's a classic thesis creep brought to you by ideologues who wish to only use data that supports their beliefs. And that's why many of them are radically underwater on their investments if they still hold them. Growth in the form of CapEx spin was the distraction mechanism used to justify their stock multiples. Let's look at this chart. Are those companies sufficiently built out and started turning profitable? Were these companies over leveraged and needing to slow growth to plug the hole in their balance sheet? How does this reduction in future growth via CapEx spin bode for their future growth? Remember state growth demonstrated via CapEx spin is a necessity to keep the Ponzi-esque structure of business going. New states plug the hole and distract from the older states that are wrecking havoc. Their opaque disclosure for same-store sales has been given a pass because they were showing top-line growth. When times are good, people don't ask questions. Each new state is making a relatively smaller contribution to the overall picture due to their increasing footprint. It's a simple problem of base effects. A new state will not make up for the malfeasance that it, that's occurred over a dozen states. People will use the above image as to why federal legalization needs to happen so that these companies can grow. But they've been growing. It also ignores how many of them have been terrible stewards of capital for the shareholders. It's been great for the debt, preferred equity, and C-suite constituents. What makes you think that they'll start acting intelligently now? Much of the evidence is to the contrary. Why wouldn't it be another bum rush of poor capital allocation in a land grab fashion and a redux of the early days if something along the lines of federal legalization and improvements in federal litigation occurred? I hate to break the news to you, but these tier one MSOs aren't growth stocks. They were growth stocks. But as I've outlined to you, the game has changed. Their best days of super growth are behind them and one could argue much growth at all. Nearly 80% of states have legalized it and 50, for medical use, and 50% of states have legalized recreational use. This means that they've captured roughly 60% of the market based upon states. According to Statistica, half of citizens' consumers live in states with legal use. Remember the Ponzi S strategy I outlined earlier? These companies need new states and new consumers to stay afloat. Well, it's getting tougher and tougher as they run out. They're halfway through and yet have been proven to be profitable. Guess it's a good thing that Germany has legalized. That'll keep the narrative going on for a while. These companies' modest or non-existent profits in mature or maturing markets are weighing down the short yet profitable gains in new markets. Roughly 80% of states have medical and 50% are recreational. Their best days are behind them in, regards, in regard to being a state-led growth story. 
yet people in large part haven't clued in. They're ingrained and emboldened through their desensitized following of old narratives back when states mattered more. An irony of this is that these speculators are telling the government to catch up to the times, and yet their investing strategy has yet to catch up to the times. The problem is that the game has changed. They've gotten to the point of diminishing returns. A new state doesn't have the same impact that it used to. Going from one state to two states is a 100% growth rate. Going from 12 states to 13 states is a 9% growth rate, all else being equal. And that additional growth isn't enough to stop the hemorrhaging that's occurring in the maturing markets that they have a footprint in currently. Tier 1 MSO Strategy They bum rush into a state, capture the high profits and high margins, and then move on to the next state. They're, they're taking the cream off the top. The problem is, is that they still own and are paying for their lingering residual business in the aftermath and fallout. It's not like they can pack up and go on to the next state with their PP&E, property, plant, and equipment. They have to build out and do it again, state after state after state after state after state after state. By the way, that's not economies of scale. The residual operations bleed out in hemorrhage cash, and that necessitates the importance of the next state. But they compound their baggage of leftover states, and, they, and the new states can't offset and compensate all their other failed states. They'll pull out of some, but keep most. They're playing the limited license game via a temporary supply-demand imbalance. They're in it for the quick grab. The problem is that they're stuck because they put a proverbial baby in the state, and now they have to tend to it, and this metaphorical baby isn't paying for itself. It's a hit it and quit it mentality, a smash and grab, a dine and dash, yet they can't quit it or dash. This theme I'm describing to you has played out enough times that the management teams should know not to go into a state if they can't make profits above the levelized and normalized costs of production. This is basic commodity economics 101, but they keep going into new states, WTF. The average stock speculator only adds fuel to the fire. It's as though they don't know how to differentiate between mid-cycle earnings and peak cycle earnings. I had a tweet about how it would be more creative for these companies to invest in T-bills than their own business because their return on capital is less than T-bills. This is an implicit statement and condemnation that these companies are value destructive. Shareholders can't deposit gross margins into their bank accounts but they are surely focused on gross margins. But the inept observer prefers a vegetative state, unplugged from reality, in order to maintain their delusion and not disrupt their Disney-esque fantasy. It's cope and fallacy. A simple rebuttal would be for them to show line items of their performance metrics in individual states, such as how their comparable sales fare while using the same store data. But they don't. Well, why not? Well, the best I can tell is they'd prefer to obfuscate because it wouldn't be beneficial or flattering to do so, and it isn't required or expected of them. This is the opaque, opaque market that they're in, for now. The devil is in the details. They don't want you to separate the wheat from the chaff because they don't want you to see their rotten kernels. I expect, at some point in the future, that they will provide higher resolution data. But that day will come when institutional traders, the adults, start participating in these names. The funny thing is how so many retail investors say that for, for these names to rocket, they need more volume and attention from professional money. Yet again, I think the opposite. Professional money will see these companies for the garbage that they largely are and will want no part. Retail can't understand that because retail doesn't understand arithmetic. Plus, it classes clashes with their ideology. These companies have flatline and are getting desperate. Of course, necessity is the mother of invention, so perhaps they'll make some profits by riding the ship and tightening up their finances. But remember, they move as a group. They need others just as desperate so they can tactically collude. They need a price leader, and may I remind you, it's not as though their revenues have flatline, but they're printing profits. They flatline revenues and are still unprofitable. 
dumb money. I don't generally care for this pejorative term when referring to retail investors, but the shoe fits in this case. The best and simplest explanation of what's happening is twofold. They're, politically, they're, they're political hobbyists and are engaging in ideological investing. There's a lot to unwrap there in those two placeholder words or phrases. I've touched upon this ideological investment numerous times. Here are a couple of instances where it was the predominant theme, here and here. I've not published an article on political hobbyism, although one is in the works. Simply put, a political hobbyist is someone who is unbeknownst to themselves engaged in politics for enjoyment, entertainment, emotionality, and as a way to bond with their peers. However, their engagement is shallow and is primarily one of consuming content without ever actually understanding or reflecting on it. Features of political hobbyism are manufacturing outrage and indignation, pontificating, mental masturbation, cheap thrills, and infotainment. This is why many investors think, or I should say feel, that legal measures or institutional traders getting involved is positive. To them, it's a foregone conclusion. I don't believe in foregone con conclusions where people go from thesis to conclusion. I believe in the antithesis and th synthesis components of the decision-making process that's part of the dialectic reasoning process. I outline that idea here under the segment thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Yet these bag holders have trauma bonded and seemingly, are, and seemingly their ethos is similar to Stockholm Syndrome. They have a ready impulse in excusing the captors of their capital. The cognitive dissonance is strong in them. Unaware that they've been swindled into believing the state-led growth Ponzi scheme with the subtext of legislative catalyst. And as such, they've developed a schema to explain it away. Cope and fallacy for the win. These people are sick, twisted, and deranged. They take being a bag holder as a badge of honor and treat it as a point of pride. So-called war scars. So why wouldn't they excuse the sin of their management teams when they themselves were poor allocators of capital. I touched upon this psychological phenomenon known as projection in an article I've written. It's under the word of caution segment. It would be wise of you to recognize that you're doing this if you are indeed one of these people, because it means you're lowering your standards and tolerance of what is and isn't acceptable. This implies you have a low hurdle rate for an investment, which increases the probability of you losing money. It's kind of important not to lose money. Most recently, I heard a guy on a podcast say that he doesn't factor in opportunity cost into his investing decisions. WTF. The degree of pathology I see that's grounded in ill-conceived misnomers in the form of misguided conventional wisdom is alarming. They're sentimentally focused and valuation agnostic, quite simply because they don't know how to value a business. Infotainment with a bent on agitprop is where they're focused, swooning over headline porn or anything that confirms their narrative. They're preoccupied with force-fitting their narratives and agenda into conversations and then readily jumping to allegedly foregone conclusions. Their arguments are superficial, rhetorical, smoke and mirrors spoken in a specious fashion. Copen fallacy is their kabuki theater in Potomkin Village. They're concerned with pontificating their idea and mentally masturbating, then they're at gaining a cursory insight into the markets. They're always chasing the next shiny object, soon to forget the old shiny objects that their companies are selling off at a massive loss or taking impairments on. Don't forget about those $225 million worth of impairments of Cureleaf. And if they do remember, they congratulate the management teams for doing so because they're right-sizing. LOL. Buying companies that need government catalysts is playing the wrong game. Buying companies that are their own catalyst and internally managed well is the correct game. The wrong level of analysis. I've come to the conclusion that most people, most of the time, view things on a wrong level of analysis. A large part of that is that people direct the framing of a conversation in a way that's flattering and beneficial towards them not necessarily in the direction of reality. For example, in one of my articles, 
I noted how people were justifying the earnings multiple of a stock by comparing it to even more expensive stocks. They measured it relatively instead of absolutely. Put differently, they essentially said that a stock was a buy because it was less expensive than a more expensive stock. Um, what? With that said, anytime anyone is viewing something on a certain level of analysis, I presume that it's the wrong level of analysis. In this case, the amount of attention superficially dedicated to the federal level hints to me that this is probably the wrong level of analysis to be a successful investor in this space. I don't care if it becomes federally legal on every possible level come tomorrow. I'm not buying it at a 50 times price to sales ratio, let alone a 10 times price to sale ratio. And yet market pundits were trying to justify doing that very thing a few years ago. That's really worth thinking about. And they used to say the same growth story to validate it. The same growth story that they're still using to this day. So what's with this obsessive fixation and compulsion to focus on a federal litigation? It's a hot button issue. Also in any short time period, which is most people's investing time period, it's a low probability, high magnitude occurrence. That's the level of analysis they're viewing it on. And what did I tell you about people's level of analysis? And if you want to get crazy, you could view the companies on such measurements as return on capital or their debt service coverage ratio. Remember, half a decade has been laden with people focusing on the meta and foregoing the micro. It's exactly that which allowed people to ignore buying a company at 20 times sales, 50 times sales, and earlier on in all of this, hundreds of times sales. It's because they were focused on the wrong details. The more crucial and pertinent details that would determine their returns, statistically and historically speaking. Yet again, it isn't that federal lit litigation doesn't matter. That's the wrong framing and level of analysis. It's that there's other things that matter too. You should care about the bullish catalyst that you can evaluate, build confidence on, and structure a portfolio around with confidence. I own a master plan community developer in Florida, the St. Joe Company, and then ticker symbol JOE for those who are interested. And People want to know how the PMI falling in Europe might impact my thesis. WTF? Why do so many people think that they have the capacity to view matters in such a macro and obtuse fashion and to think that they'll then know how that will trickle down to such a micro matter? Yet again, it's the wrong level of analysis. The problem is that these hubristic fools will come to a conclusion. It just won't be the profitable one. A new state is coming online. There's a new state that has recreational use on the ballot, exclamation point. There's a new state that has legalized recreational use, exclamation point. Who cares? Which isn't to say that it doesn't matter per se, but how much does it matter? And how does it matter? To what extent does it matter? And perhaps if you're so daring, what else might matter? Since 2018, the number of states allowing recreational use has gone up hundreds of percent. Yet the stocks aren't triples, quadruples. For the most part, the stocks have crashed 50% plus, and that's being generous. You wouldn't think that this massive divergent you would think that this massive divergence might make a person ask some questions, such as, what role does a new state coming online have in my particular company that I'm invested in? Uh, what impact might it have on the company I'm invested in? Uh, yeah, I'll just say that. Yet again, this isn't to say that a new state coming online doesn't matter. It most certainly does. We're now at the point of nearly half the states legalizing recreational use. That's a big deal optically. And since people behave based upon optics, it can most certainly influence behavior. What behavior? How about the politicians getting their act together? We're to the point of nearly half the states legalizing recreational use, but this creates hazards. For instance, you run the risk of not having enough bandwidth to pay attention to what's happening in all the other states outside of headline big news. The companies don't make it any easier on you because they refuse to break down the numbers by market. 
I can assure you that most people struggle to listen to a conference call, let alone pay attention to all the moving parts which are independent states. How many people are paying attention to flower, pricing, flower prices in each of the respective states? Someone will talk to you for 15 minutes about all the exciting news about a new state coming online, but they can't tell you what's going on in the other states that the company has been operating in. Like I said earlier, they chase one shiny thing after the next thing, and they often view things on the wrong level of analysis. People might point out that cash flow is increasing, but fail to mention that the consequence of accounts payable piling up and taxes not being paid. Like I said, people view things on the wrong level of analysis. Flattering information is regurgitated and unflattering information is swept under the rug and repressed. You'll come to find out, too, that these people don't do their own research, which means that whatever they say and think is from the demigods they worship, and those demigods have the perverse incentives to only say flattering things. Remember this next time when someone only has positive things to say. It's a symptom of a non-playable character who doesn't think for themselves and is barely sentient. Their speech has been constrained and censored for them due to their primarily being a regurgitating rote promoter. And they're clueless about the fact that they're primarily a regurgitating rote promoter. Putting the cart ahead of the horse and how the tail wags the dog. It isn't that legislation isn't important. It's that one thing, it's that other things are important too. It isn't that one shouldn't entertain these ideas. Factor in the considerations. Come up with a spectrum of probable and possible outcomes, both imminent and inevitable and weigh counterfactuals. That's all important and crucial to developing contingency plans. Foresight is forewarned and forewarned is forearmed. But I get the impression that all this top-down pontification is being done at the cost of doing prudent bottom-up research. All of us only have so much time, energy, focus, cognitive capacity, and processing power. Even if you got all the answers to all the questions you have around the federal matters, it still won't tell you what to buy. Or you could look at companies from a bottom-up approach, assume current conditions stay the same or improve, and model what that would look like. One of these strategies gets you invested and one doesn't. And I can't help but think that that's not an accident. People want to run their mouths with minimal skin in the game versus putting in actual work and disciplining themselves. It's no wonder the vast majority of people have a behavioral preference for the former over the latter. The serenity prayer is needed in this space. When all that seemingly matters is legislative reform, all the companies in the sector get a free pass, right? Their sins are absolved. But I think that's a horrible way of looking at things. Very few are cognizant of the fact that some operators have done well while others have done terribly. Oh sure, they'll recognize it on an intellectual and philosophical level, but they won't deploy and manifest that wisdom in their behavior. Here's a fun question to ask these people. If everything you could ever dream of happened tomorrow, how much would you pay for these companies? What is it worth? Hundreds of percent above where it's at is what I've heard from many people. So what they're telling me is that if everything happened tonight, come tomorrow, when the market opens, and these things are, are opening up 50% on the day with news like that, they would be a buyer. After all, you'd have hundreds of percent of upside, right? Right? Why wouldn't you buy it on a gap up 50% day when you just said it has hundreds of percent up upside with certain catalysts occurring and then those catalysts occur. You should be more than happy to buy with 50% upside, right? Hasn't the risk been taken care of since all the things you could dream of happened? But my guess is that most people wouldn't buy. That's really worth thinking about. In summary of the above, the idea of an embedded growth story around the potential of new states is a fool's errand and an evergreen pipe dream. So, all one needs to do is see how they fared in other states. The reason they're not profitable is 
profitable is because of their failings in other states. It will go to reason that unless they've done something radically different, that trend will continue. They've awkwardly fumbled forward selling pipe dreams which entices people to pour money into them. It's that external cash flow that keeps them propped up, not internally generated organic cash flow, and that is what makes them a zombie company. New state expansion buys them time. The state-led growth story is a Ponzi structure. You need new states to pay off the sins of the old states. They're not trying to pay the piper, both because it's outside of their strategy, but also because they literally can't. Or that that's all they can do is pay the piper, and themselves of course, after which there's no money left for shareholders and not much left for growth, which is why we saw CapEx spend rapidly drop over the last couple of years. This is a conflict of interest dilemma I'm speaking to you about, a principal agent problem. It's a control fraud, control fraud of the legal kind, a so-called bust out. They're in large part lifestyle companies for the management's teams and C-suites. The implication is that these companies can only do well when times are good. And since good times taper off, then so will their ability to do well, which leaves what? them doing poorly. And it should be no coincidence that you will be poor by investing in companies doing poorly. Yet the secured debt holders preferred equity and C-suites do quite well. There's more than one way to express a view. And I'd say thus far the institutionally managed money, family offices, and accredited investors have made smart moves by investing in those vehicles rather than the public stock. <coughs> It's clear that at price it's clear that as prices normalize due to balanced market, their margins get squeezed. Since they're not taking the time to be profitable in a normalized price market, everything is eventually going to go the way of California and Canada. They're profitless companies in perpetuity. Legislative reform will give them a boost, but like any good hedonic treadmill, that too will normalize. I suspect is a stair-step function to break even, not necessarily profitability. I outlined in my game theory article concerns I have in regard to this blue sky optimism. I want operators who've demonstrated core competence in capital allocation and concerns towards operations. I want them to have the wherewithal and faculties via their creative productive capacity to generate ideas and solutions and to properly formulate oh and properly formulate solutions. That's a rare trait to find due to the mass cranial rectal inversion that many management teams suffer from. We must look past CAPEX as a proxy for growth and stop treating growth as though it's always a good thing in a decontextualized manner, as though growth is a means in and of itself. It's not, it's a means to an end, and preferably that end being profitable. Many seem to forget that it's a mean to an end. When you bring up many managers' records, people look past it. The best I can tell is it's sort of like this. It's a, we need to spend just, we need to spend just so we can tread water and maintain relevance so we don't get usurped and lose our spot, place status and claim in the pseudo oligopoly hierarchies that have been created from regulatory capture. This would explain why I've been talked down to when I bring up return on capital. People care about the deployment of capital, but not its return. It all gets swept under the rug with thought terminating cliches formulated in an ostensible fashion, such as this industry is in its infancy stage and it needs to grow. But yet again, that presupposes that needing to grow in an industry in its infancy stage requires you to be profitless. That's the idea that these people have in their heads. They've become conditioned, habituated, and trained to act this way. This has been reinforced in them by their culture and peers and led them to be desensitized to meaningful metrics of performance. As a matter of fact, it's nearly become taboo to speak of profitability metrics. These people have this idea that if a company keeps growing, that it'll eventually end good. They have no evidence for this, but they won't stop them. But that won't stop them with some anecdotal ex exception to the rule to support their case. Of course, that example is 95% of the time. Look at Amazon. 
In large part, large MSOs have poor, literally and figuratively, business models. The large players always get the most fanfare. That's just how it works. MSOs would be international conglomerates if each state was thought of as a country. This is why they don't have economies of scale. The unit economics just don't work. If anything, they have diseconomies of scale. Have they gotten better and leaner, pushing out better quality products at lower costs? Have they revamped their more mature markets? Each state is siloed and caught off from the others. Once the interstate travel opens up, then you'll have a bunch of abandoned assets and accompanying write downs. Why grow in Maine in a costly warehouse when you can buy a plot of land in California and grow outside or in a greenhouse and ship it to Maine? The state led growth story is one of operators desperate for flesh blood, i.e., cash flow. When each state was once a boom and is now a bust, you see why external factors become more relevant because these companies are more necessitous. These companies are hammers and everything looks like a nail. Unprofitable operators blame the markets instead of themselves. It's classic blame-shifting DARVO. It's propaganda. For those who don't know what DARVO stands for, it stands for Deny, Accuse, Reverse, Victim, Offender. It's under the framework it's under this framework that you come to understand people's focus on the state-led growth story and political catalysts. It's an admission and recognition that these companies are dead in the water and a lost cause without external support. This neurotic obsessive fixation in regards to the state-led growth story and political catalysts is for a reason. These companies can no longer rely on state expansion in and of itself. These companies now need external catalysts to compensate for their internal blunders. This is where legislative reform becomes important. They need larger and larger catalysts to keep them treading water. They need to show short-term growth to maintain the rhetorical smokescreen of being a growth company. This is why you need hype around Germany or Poland. It's not because it'll make a meaningful difference to their financials, and definitely probably not, uh, not to, but in all reality, not to their profitability either, but because it's crucial in maintaining the narrative, more specifically, the growth narrative. A problem with this obsessive pathological and neurotic fixation with litigation and reform is it results in the byproduct of excusing unprofitability. This attitude normalizes unprofitability by excusing it due to externalities. It shifts the locus of control that management teams have and, and places it on some external existential malevolent predator called the government. I don't care too much about the DEA, HHS, blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to bother myself or waste my time with such an existential looming situation so I can get all hot and bothered by it. Now, does that mean I haven't considered the implications of it? No. What it does mean is, for all intents and purposes, I could care less about the quote-unquote newest development. After five years of crying wolf, you think more people would share in this attitude. But nope, they don't. When that's the catalyst you're hoping for, you're already screwing up. I look at 280E, or any such matter, as an afterthought, a bonus an optionality play, not the damn focus of my thesis, not as a crutch that self-imposed, unforced, erroring, desperately handicapped companies need to stay solvent. I wouldn't be surprised if, if at one point they tell their shareholders some, some of this nonsense that Kathy Woods once said about how uh, the silver lining in their $2 billion loss is uh, how it potentially offsets the tax bill for the fund in the upcoming futures. Uh, that's, that's good stuff. Difference in beliefs. The difference in axiomatic beliefs is why this can't be resolved. One believes slow and steady, rabbit and hare wins the race. The other believes the insatiable appetite and radical unhealthy growth wins the race. They think that slow and steady gets left behind and loses competitive advantage. But the They've not learned the moral of the story and its lessons. Yes, optically, you do get left behind. But what, you, but what are you betting on? Are you betting on who's leading the majority of the race? Or who will cross the finish line first or at all? The problem is people conflate those two to mean the same thing. 
When the incentive structure for those running the race, management, is a compensation package predicated on EBITDA and revenue, then perverse incentives will occur. There are two different games being played here, two different styles. Style number one, take advantage of short-term price and accompanying margins. Also establish a foothold via a first mover advantage in each new state. Once prices normalize, they'll be unprofitable, but they get to show growth for a couple of years, at which point hopefully they can go on to the next state. But this leaves many corpses behind in zombie operations. Immediate gratification with strong initial profitable impulse. Style 2. Coming up the rear, they're slow and steady. They'll often get there later and won't be able to profit off of the initial supply-demand imbalance. The established foothold of first movers will deteriorate over time as more profitable players take market share and usurp them. However, this sort of player will be profitable because they've taken the time to dial in their skills. These players have stayed within their means for years, honing their skills and dialing it in. They're capable and competent in providing quality and a price less than their competition while remaining profitable and quality and, and selling quality product. They've sharpened themselves and now they have an edge. They're now ready to expand and that's exactly what's happening. Hint, hint, cough, cough, grown rogue. Why are the vast majority of companies unprofitable? Well, why? Why are the vast majority of them unprofitable? If you're like most people, you'll blame the government. But let me ask you this then. How are there profitable companies then? Remember the variable that you cited as a reason for why most companies aren't profitable? The government? Well, if you could be bothered to keep constant your comparisons and control for variables, you'd realize that the profitable companies are also affected by the same government. Now you might say, but if it was federally legalized, then, <clears throat> then these companies could be profitable. But that argument presupposes that federal legalization would make the vast majority of these companies profitable, which doesn't seem obvious to me. And why do I have to tell you that by profitable, I mean positive net income? It's as though you've become so pathologized by constant gaslighting from others and yourself that you've come to believe that adjusted EBITDA is profit. Strange, don't you think? Do you manage your own finances based on EBITDA? Why not? Who cares about take home pay and having the capacity to pay your bills? After all, Aren't you a growth story with your raises, promotions, and capital appreciation from your stocks and homes and other invested assets? And growth stories need not worry about cash flow and actual profit, right? After all, that's why you don't need to worry about such things as return on capital. At least that's what I've been told, because who needs to make back the money that they've borrowed or invested, right? In conclusion, maybe I'm just wrong on all of this. That's what other people are gaslighting me into thinking. Here's an example of such wisdom. If you think that the market gives two shits about return on capital as a meaningful thesis for pot stocks at this stage, there isn't anything I can say that will convince you otherwise. Or how about this charming piece? Reform is all that really matters in the short term. And let's not forget this classic cop-out by frame-shifting things to the future in order to avoid responsibility for past behavior. A big problem with backwards-looking analysis is the lack of understanding the future. That's a beautiful piece of plablum and platitude that I've heard way too many times. It isn't that that's not factually a true statement. The problem is the implicit subtextual sentimental insinuation of it. I've seen and heard this sort of rhetorical debate tactic too many times to count. It's a dismissive tactic meant to nullify any culpability of past performance and is thought terminating in its purpose. It's asking for a clean slate to a checkered past. Are these serious reasons to think that the future will be are there serious reasons to think that the future will be different than the past? Are there reasons to think that those trait characteristics displayed by people in the past aren't a patternable phenomenon and are instead a one off? Where's the proof? And wouldn't any proof of change exist in the past and thus not be relevant? And that's the point, to never be held accountable. 
Isn't that what most people are really after? I mean, unless it's something good, then they'll be more than willing to be accountable. People like to speak to the future, detached from the past. What better breeding ground for pathology and fantasy to live out its life of dreams of copes and fallacy? So, if you actually believe in a rhetorical smokescreen that's meant to obfuscate matters in a plausible and specious fashion, then I invite you to take back that girlfriend who cheated on you. Move back in with that roommate who stole from you. After all, the past doesn't help you understand the future and what those people will do by extension. Oh, let me say that again. So if you actually believe in the past doesn't predict the future or help uh, set your expectations of the future, then you should take back the girl who cheated on you or take back that roommate who stole from you because after all, the past doesn't help you understand the future and what those people will do in this upcoming future and by extension how you're supposed to behave. You see how stupid that sounds? I sure hope so. Let me tell you what really frustrates me in regards to these sorts of tweets. They had many more characters available in their tweet to generate nuance and context, yet they chose not to. The reason they didn't add context is because that was beside the point. The point was to use a specious statement to dismiss and undermine the topic I was discussing without having to provide any of an evidence on their part, and in some insidious way they think that they're right by default of my statement being allegedly invalid. You heard that right. They think they're right because I'm wrong. FYI, an idea is right based upon its merits, not the lack of merit of another idea. So even if I was wrong, that still doesn't mean that they're right. But humans can't be bothered with that, now can they? They weren't concerned with the truth. They were concerned with confirming their biases. And guess what? It's that very degree of intellectual lethargy and lack of nuance and contextualization that's at the heart of today's entire piece. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Pathology and bias know no bounds. If you display it outside of investing realm, there's no reason to think that it won't creep into your investing decisions. And that's worth thinking about in and of itself. So with that said, I'll now leave you to think about that. Thank you for watching.